let's be real, if we're using AWS, we just have to understand how this darn pricing works. So let's get into it. Let's understand how pricing works in AWS. AWS's services work on a pay-as-you-go pricing model. This means that for each service or resource that you use in AWS, you pay for exactly the amount that you use, no more, no less. Some services do have reservation options, which provide significant discounts compared to the more on-demand pricing. For example, if you are using EC2 instances and you know that they need to be running constantly, then you might look at more of a savings plan instead of doing the on-demand instances. The savings plan can save you up to 72% compared to doing the on-demand instances, which is quite a bit. Other services offered more tiered pricing, like storage, for example. The more storage that you have, the lower the pricing is per gigabyte, but you've still got to have a lot in order to get that lower sort of price. It's like buying in bulk. There's a couple of different tools that are really useful to us, including the AWS pricing calculator. This helps us to estimate the price of actually using AWS. You can organize your AWS estimates by group. And when you have created it, you can actually share it with a link to others. For example, the pricing calculator can group estimates around how much you would spend on each virtual instance. Dedicated instances is something else to be aware of when it comes to pricing. This is where you have AWS hardware whose only job it is, is to run the services that you require. This gives you extra isolation and can be important when it comes to compliance or regulatory requirements, but it will end up costing you more. Services that use this are EC2, Relational Database Services, and Outpost. Let's take a look at some pricing examples to really understand this fully. AWS Lambda, for example. With Lambda, you are charged on the number of requests for your functions and the time that it takes for them to run. AWS Lambda allows 1 million free requests and up to 3.2 million of compute time per month. You can save by going for a savings plan, which you pay for more in advance. And when you get your bill, you can see the price per region. Let's have a look at how this compares with EC2. With EC2, you're paying for the compute time, but you can save quite a bit if you're using things like spot instances which is where you're basically using the leftover compute power from someone else's instance that they're not using. Cheaper, yes, but perhaps a little bit more risky. So you need to have a really tolerant application that's going to be able to handle some ups and downs in terms of computing power. Again, you can use savings plans and reserved instances to actually find some more ways to cut the cost. Final example, let's check out S3. S3 is the simple storage service. And like EC2, you just pay for what you use. But there's a couple of other things to be aware of. For example, you also need to pay for requests made to your S3 objects in buckets. Every time that a visitor visits your website and sees something that is stored in that bucket, it needs to be retrieved, and so you often get charged for this. Same with data transfers. There's actually no cost to transfer data between buckets, but if you need to transfer outside of buckets, then there is often a charge associated with that. Finally, you have management and replication. So if you want to back up everything that's in your storage, then you have to pay for those backups as well. There's also other features around analytics, inventory, and object tagging, which come at an extra cost. All in all, I'm not trying to ski you or put you off AWS at all, just to try and show you that there is a lot going on when it comes to pricing and that for whatever services you're using, it's well worth doing a bit of research into just how the pricing is calculated so that you know when the bill comes, why it is that much. Happy learning, we'll see you next time.